It's week 172, 172 weeks. And if you're new here, 172 weeks means that I started tracking the market weekly when I realized that there was really no resource for real-time data. As it's 2023, guys, the market does not move at the same pace that it used to. It moves way faster, things happen, and we need to be on top of things weekly. So that's why I started doing this in March of 2020, at the beginning of COVID, when everything changed in terms of how people buy and sell, even big ticket items, but everything, people seem to do things a little bit differently. Things moved way faster, so we needed to track things week over week. And today we're gonna to talk about the mayors, the front runners, front runners, but one person that a lot of people are ignoring, and I talked about her last week, um, so there is a little bit of the market actually report at the end of the last page of the market report. It's a little bit long this week, but it's a really important read because I went through basically all of the platforms of all of the front runners in the mayoral race. Um, and to be honest, I'm really not too impressed with what most people are saying. Perhaps as I get older, I'm getting more cynical. Um, whatever it is, I'm just not too excited about the options in front of us, except for Chloe Brown. But we really went, um, took my time to go over what people like Olivia Chow were saying. But the one thing I don't understand is why people immediately jump down her throat when she mentions increasing taxes. I think that that, I, mean, I understand why it's a triggering statement, but at the same time, we're talking about increasing the taxes um, property taxes, which are some of the lowest on the planet when compared to even regions just outside of Toronto, like Durham, for example, has incredibly high taxes. We're pretty lucky in Toronto still. So uh, I'm not too concerned about increasing property taxes, especially increasing the taxes on uh, vacant properties from one to 3%. The one thing and many things I actually don't love about Olivia Chow is her position on taxing people who she feels can afford to pay more tax. And the words she's using are too ambiguous for me. Like what does luxury mean? What does modest increase mean? These are words that she's mentioned. I've seen the number at you know $3 million in terms of the home's valuation before any of these new taxes kick in. But again, I am not 100% loving uh, the things she has to say, and I honestly don't feel like Toronto will be in a better place at the end of her um, uh, uh, stand or whatever you call it as, as mayor, but I don't think it'll be in a worse place either. Um, then we move on to candidates like Anna Bailau, who, uh, hopefully I'm saying her name correctly, who's been an advocate for affordable housing for a very long time, and she seems to really understand what is required uh, to make some things happen, but again, the focus doesn't seem to be on exactly how things are going to happen. And I really want to make sure the discussion about affordability is not focused on people who are buying and who can afford market rate rentals, because it's great to build more rentals, but that does not help the real affordability problem, which is housing the unhoused. So you can read all about this in the, uh, in the article this week. I'm not gonna go too far into this and make it a really long video. Um, but then, you know, let's move on to some other candidates right now, like Brad Bradford. Honestly, man, what were your parents thinking with that name? Um, hopefully you can hear me okay. This mic is uh, kind of flopping on my shirt. But uh, Brad Bradford is a guy who I really wanted to like root for, um, but I just am having a really hard time listening to what he has to say because they're really aren't any hard facts. And I really don't like his hardline position on um, homeless encampments and things like that without a real solution on how to tackle the root problem. Um, again, not loving what he is saying overall about uh, taking care of our city as a whole. I just don't think he gets it. Same thing with uh, Anthony Fury. How is this guy even a front runner? I do not even understand. You know what? I gotta get my notes in front of me here because there's some important things that I did wanna talk about about these guys. And I don't have my screen here, so I'm gonna have to go back here like this and put on my glasses to see what's going on here. Um, but Anthony Fury really just speaks at a bunch of sound bites. Like, did you hear the way he answered that AI question on CP24 the other day? First of all, why do we care if candidates use AI? I think if you're not using AI as a business person to help move things forward, I think you're missing out. I don't see it as a negative thing. I don't see it as a bad thing. But anyway, that's besides the point. Um, again, 
Um, Anthony Fury talks a lot about eliminating the uh, land transfer tax, especially the municipal portion of the land transfer tax for first time buyers, which honestly, I don't think that that's a terrible idea. But again, you're going to incentivize to get more people to get into the market, which does not help the, the, the situation that he thinks he's trying to solve. Again, affordability is not a problem that can be solved in the context of home ownership for people that refuse to step down on the property ladder and buy what they can in a massive growing city. So that's not an affordability problem. That is a, I can't accept reality problem and I'm going to complain because I don't have the same experience that my parents did buying in the same city when it was not a world-class city. So affordability, the conversation around affordability needs to be focused on housing the unhoused, but more than just providing a home for a homeless person, because we know that that's not as simple as that. There need to be a ton of other services in place to make sure that that person can maintain a home and actually grow from this whole experience. So anyway, this Anthony Fury character really has nothing valuable to say. He does have a fairly barbaric stance on um, uh, dealing with homelessness in general, uh, similar to some of the other candidates like Mark Saunders um, or Sanders, I'm sorry, or is it Saunders? Anyway, we'll get there in a moment. Um, you know, they have this, you know, zero tolerance policy. Well, you really can't have a hardline zero tolerance policy on homeless encampments when there aren't a ton of safe places for people to go. I'm really sorry to say that, but it, it's, it, it's true. And then moving on to somebody like a, you know, like a, uh, like a Mitzi Hunter, you know, who actually does not have a terrible plan in terms of, you know, raising some funds by increasing property taxes by 6%. Not the end of the world, honestly, it's really not. As I said, our property taxes are some of the lowest on the planet. We could use a bump there. So honestly, not a huge deal. However, I do have, oops, I do have some issues with Mitzi Hunter in this situation is that she wants to create a new municipal organization. And a couple of other candidates also want to create these new municipal organizations. Let's break that down a little bit. Let's say I become mayor tomorrow. I'm there for four years, unless there's some sort of scandal. Do you know how long it takes to create a new organization, to fund a new organization, to employ and staff a new organization, and then to start your mandate? All of the money that you create by doing all of these things is going to go to creating this new organization. It's not necessary. There are existing organizations in place that need to be improved. Toronto Community Housing, Create TO, all of these things already exist, which some of the other candidates are going to be leveraging. So I would really be incredibly skeptical about any of the candidates who want to create some new organization to handle some new problem. But these are old problems that have organizations that have failed at solving those problems. So let's improve what is already there versus creating something new. I don't like that at all. I think it's a giant waste of money. I think it's misguided. I think that it is ego driven. And I don't think that anybody who wants to do this should be given a single vote. But hey, that's just me. Um, moving on to uh, my boy, Josh Matlow over here. And honestly, I really, really, really used to love this guy. And I wanted to like him again. But I can't, because again, he is Captain Soundbite with no real, real plan. He does want to double the uh, land transfer tax for foreign buyers, but we already have a ban on that. It's kind of being dealt with at the federal level right now. So I don't understand putting any energy into that right now, but he is, and I don't know why. And looking back at um, some other things he wants to do, which I kind of do agree with, I don't disagree with increasing the taxes and charges on people buying more than one property or a second, third, fourth home. I don't disagree with that at all. It's kind of hard to disagree with that. Those are the people that I think can afford it, the ones that are buying extra properties, right? So, you know, I don't want to talk a ton about Mark Saunders. Um, his heavy-handed approach to Toronto and dealing with homelessness is not good for our city. I'm going to skip right by him. Um, and then we're going to talk really about Chloe Brown. And Chloe Brown is somebody who seems to actually understand what is required to make the city better for the people that it needs to be made better for. You don't need to make the city of Toronto better for me. You don't need to make the city of Toronto better for most of you that are watching this. It's good for us. We are good. And if you need a moment to kind of digest that, take it. If you've got a home, you've got a car, you've got a family, maybe you don't have a car, but you've got a roof over your head and you're not struggling and everybody has a different definition of struggling, I get it. 
this election is not about us. We have to think about the people that actually need to be helped. We all need help from time to time, but there are some people that have had a foot on their head the entire time, keeping them down. These are the people that need help, and these are the people that Chloe Brown is going to step up for. She is somebody that understands exactly what it takes to help the people that need help. And she has laid out a pretty great housing first platform, and she's actually done a ton of research into other cities that have really successfully uh, initiated these programs from, uh, there's a city in New Jersey, a municipality in Utah, even Finland as a front runner by reducing homelessness by 91%, not in Finland, but I believe it was in, uh, oh, I don't know, uh, it was in either New Jersey or the Utah city. One of those two American cities reduced homelessness by 91% using some of these housing first initiatives that Chloe Brown is really, really focused on. In my opinion, she is the only candidate, candidate that seems to understand what the actual problem is and has a specific plan to tackle it and has a specific way to fund it. So I would recommend you research Chloe Brown as in-depth as you possibly can. And, you know, I want to make sure that I don't miss anything for these initial candidates. But, you know, again, not wanting to discount Anna Bailao and, and Olivia Chow um, because they seem to be, you know, decent candidates and they're not going, they're going to leave Toronto in a, in, in a good place when it's all said and done. I just feel like they're making promises they're not going to be able to deliver on. Everybody is, actually. And that's kind of where I have the big problem. I like that Olivia Chow does have specific numbers and Anna Bailao do have specific numbers in terms of how many rental units they want to create and all that stuff. But, you know, I really don't see anybody else other than Chloe Brown that is putting anything viable forward. And then if you want to talk about the federal level, this morning I was going back and forth on, on my Instagram with somebody who um, was a little disrespectful, I'm not going to lie, but, um, you know, Pierre Polyev, who loves to talk in sound bites, and I don't know why he's even talking about affordability, but they're all talking about affordability and being able to purchase homes, and it's just not a relevant discussion, especially when he's talking about homes in the U.S. are cheaper because they have more of them. Imagine if we built more homes, we can have cheaper ones too. Like, imagine, like, let that sink in for a second. Like, why do you think homes are cheaper in some U.S. cities than they are here in Canada? Is it because that there's a reason for people to be here, which is causing more people to come here? I don't know. Maybe. So it's these overly simplified comparisons that seem to really make sense to some people. But if you really dig down and understand the things that they are saying at the federal level, it really doesn't make sense. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not some sort of, like, Justin Trudeau fanboy, but you're never going to see me walk around with those F Trudeau flags because that makes you look like you know, not the smartest, you know, sharpest tool in the shed. You know what I mean? Um, it's that kind of reactionary politics that I'm trying to avoid here and really dig deep and understand what people are saying. So I would encourage you to not go off of sound bites you see on TikTok, Instagram, or anywhere else. If you take the time, all of the information is out there on all of the candidates and really form a good idea of who is in the running and what they stand for. And if you don't connect with somebody like Chloe Brown, that's cool. Connect with whoever you connect with, but please make an informed decision. And I don't know, did you want to talk about the market at all? We can talk about the market. Not much has changed week over week. Um, oh, but there is an amazing article that I've hyperlinked in this week's market report. It's by Benjamin Tall, the chief economist at CIBC, who has put out a very interesting opinion piece about what if AI were to make these decisions on whether rates should go up or not, you know, should, whether the Bank of Canada should do this or that. And again, I ate a lot of shit last week for, you know, saying that rates weren't going to go up. And a lot of people were like, see, I told you so. But honestly, I still think it was the bad. It was not the right move. And this AI model kind of confirms it. So I really encourage you to read that and let me know what you think about it. But the market overall is pretty much the same as it was last week. Condo supply is getting to the point where um, there is going to be a lot of balance in the market as we head deep into the summer. But summertime's coming. It's time to chill. We shouldn't see too much activity in the market. Listen, if rates get raised again in July, I feel like there's going to be almost a halt to buying activity. So if anybody absolutely needs to sell, like you got to do it right now because like your window is almost closed for that opportunity. Uh, we'll see what the fall market brings. It should be better. Um, but overall, the market is stronger than it was. I don't see any reason to be panicked or alarmed about anything. 
Um, I'm excited about this new uh, municipal election here. So let's see what happens. But any market questions, comment below. We'll talk. I said I was going to make this short. Not that short, but here we go. Our memorial, the spring team from the raccoon den in my office. I couldn't get up. I got too many calls to do here. Um, so I will see you next week. And uh, let's talk about this stuff. I'm excited. Let's go.